Good evening. There are several of you in this room that have done Y Care Nets. And it's just an opportunity to get it in their own words. My name is Margaret Cole, and I am your CEO. We are excited to have our online guests tonight. Welcome. The video you just watched was Corey and Jessica Williams from Firefly Lane. They have graciously partnered with CareNet for many years. Corey and I go way back with CareNet Banquets. We love our partners. Without them, we would not be able to do what we do. And I would like to thank everyone who has made this night happen. Because of their generous donations, this event has been completely underwritten. So all donations tonight, thank you. And thank you, Crosspoint. There are several key staff members here right now for this beautiful venue. We cannot do this event without you. And how splend. So, we went Italian. Do I get a thumbs up? And you did not have to pick from three desserts. You got a taste of all three. <laughs> I would like to take this time to acknowledge some very important guests that we have in attendance tonight. If you are a preacher or a pastor, please stand. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to partner with the faith community and take a stand for life. And leaders, you saw the individuals standing. We are working together for a common cause. If you are a board member, staff member, or volunteer, please stand. I salute you, your dedication, your love of CareNet, and your commitment to changing lives. It's not an easy position. CareNet empowers individuals to make an informed choice concerning their pregnancy and sexual health. CareNet is in partnership with the Christian community to dramatically reduce the number of lives lost to or harmed by abortion. CareNet opened our doors in June of 1995 and have been serving Dixon and surrounding counties for 26 years. Normally, I would share with you about CareNet's vision for the next year. However, I believe the Lord has a different vision for this year's banquet. I would like to focus on honoring CareNet's founder and former CEO, Christine Russell, who earlier this year left her temporary post in this world for her eternal home with her savior she deeply loved. She was a beloved friend to many in the room. She was a mentor and a valiant leader in the fight for life in Dixon County and beyond. To give you a little background and for those who may not have had the privilege to know her personally. Chris was born in Beverly, Massachusetts. She was wife of Gary and mother to Sharon and Josh. 
She and Gary were married in December of 1973. As a young military couple, they lived briefly in Misawa, Japan, where both their children were born. After completion of Gary's military service, they made their way to Dixon, where they established roots and set up their home. Throughout the 90s, Chris and Gary attended Restoration Church of Dixon, where they served in the middle and high school ministry. It was at a youth event in Nashville, in fact, that Chris first heard the need for outreach towards women in crisis pregnancy situations. And the burden, and it was a burden, remained on her heart and mind thereafter. In 1993, she responded to an ad in the Dixon Herald asking for help in launching a local crisis pregnancy center. The first step would soon set in motion the beginnings of what we know as CareNet today. And it started with her involvement in the initial steering committee, which later became the organizational's board. After months of planning, it was Chris's pioneering attitude that urged the group to become an official 501c3 nonprofit. Chris stated, my life was forever changed when I walked in faith and did what God asked me to do. But I have to admit, it wasn't without a huge fight. God took the least qualified person to do a work for him. He created this incredible nonprofit from dust and made it into what it is today. If you have ever had the opportunity to have a conversation with Chris, especially one which surrounded her involvement with CareNet, you already know the profound humility she possessed. She was truly a woman of greatness who never considered herself more than a servant. She embodied the spirit that was made CareNet so effective in reaching the women we serve. The formerly named Crisis Pregnancy Center or Crisis Pregnancy Center of Middle Tennessee officially opened to the public May the 19th of 1995. And it was first opened at 101 West Railroad Street. Chris became the director of the center the following year, and the CPC of Middle Tennessee eventually moved into the small house at 305 South Main Street, and in 2008 initiated a 3,700 square foot expansion to include ultrasound services that were so desperately needed to reach women in crisis pregnancies. This pivotal season brought big changes as these expanded services launched CareNet into being classified as a medical facility. It was during this transition that the CPC of Middle Tennessee changed its name to CareNet Pregnancy Medical Center. Chris was personally committed to excellence, continually learning and growing and taking courses, reading and developing her gifts, even while she was building CareNet's brand in Dixon County. Her enduring mark on CareNet is the commitment to excellence that we aim for in every event and every aspect of the ministry. Chris was gracious in building bridges and alliances within our community as an untiring advocate for the sanctity of life. She was God's instrument to save the lives of many, many unborn children, to befriend many mothers in crisis who otherwise would have been deceived and coerced into the evil of abortion. She brought the message of hope to every person she encountered at CareNet. 
She retired her role as CEO of CareNet after 22 years of service in August of 2017 and officially retired from staff in December of 2018. And at the 2018 banquet, we named the conference room in her honor. And now the conference room is named in her memory. Even though retirement, influ her influence remained as a central part of daily operations, it was an imprint that will undoubtedly be embedded into the DNA of CareNet for a, as long as the Lord allows it to remain. We personally and professionally are eternally grateful for Chris's vision, determination, and lasting impact of Christine Lee Russell. She has a, a word for us. You start out fundraising, you have no clue what you're doing, but you try to put something on, you, you look at what other people are doing and you, you do your best. And the first ones you might come up with, a couple thousand dollars, um, the board has said that they need, that they've approved a budget of like $30,000 and you're not even sure how you're going to do that. And so one of the biggest things I did, and I think um, the smartest things we did was we hired uh, a group to come in and teach us how to do a walk. And then they taught us, that did so well, we had them come in and teach us how to do a banquet. But I can remember the first banquet and Alan Watson said, so what do you consider um, a successful banquet? And I looked at him and I said, honestly, if somebody shows up. <laughs> that was Chris. I miss that woman so much. So right now I would like to introduce to you our main speaker, Keith Farron. He is an author and speaker who has been speaking at conferences, churches, universities, and banquets for 25 years. I actually met him in St. Louis. Liz and I were like, we got to have him. He was supposed to have been here in 2020. <laughs> yeah, you can tell them where you, where you live. His passion is helping people not just read and study the Bible, but deeply enjoy it. He has been partnering with pregnancy centers for over a decade and is passionate about seeing women, men, and children and entire communities see the value of life and experience God's grace and freedom. Let me welcome Keith Farron, and he's going to help me move this. Sure. That's good. Hi. So you showed up. I guess that's a success, according to Chris. So, no, it, it is so good to be here on so many levels because I remember March 12th of 2020, I was on it. Oh, yeah. I was on an airplane coming home from speaking at a CareNet banquet in the Kansas City area. Was flying home, and I had gotten a text from my, my three kids who were at that time high school, middle school, and elementary school, and my wife, who's a kindergarten teacher, who they, they said, We've got the next two weeks off of school to get this virus under control. I think it was a little more than two weeks, but uh, yeah, over the next two weeks, what actually ended up happening is all of my live events got canceled, and it was one of those things where I, the reason that I'm thrilled to be here, not only am I passionate about CareNet and passionate about this ministry, but 3D people are just awesome, <laughs> right? As somebody who has spent the last quarter century speaking on live stages, no one ever tells you that your webcam doesn't laugh at your jokes. Talking to a webcam 
when you know the people on the other side are eating ice cream and scrolling Instagram. You know, they, they say they're at a virtual conference, but virtual conference means we're sitting on our couch in our pajamas eating ice cream and, right, there you go. So here we are. And my goal, honestly, is twofold tonight. I want to accomplish two things. One, I want to paint such a clear picture of the importance of this ministry that we raise a ton of money. You, you told them they were giving money. Okay. Whew. So, money. We're going to do that. The other is beyond that, the next time that you read your Bible, I want you to like it more. Not believe it more, but my, my passion is helping churches, families, individuals, banquets have what I call the fourth conversation, because we have three conversations about the Bible. The basic conversation, is it God's word? Is it true? Should we read it? That's where we start. The second conversation, is it reliable? Right? Is what we have in English, what was originally written, and there's, that's the technical conversation, the reliability conversation. And then we have the third conversation, which is the practical application conversation. Do, does the Bible make any difference Sunday afternoon through Saturday night? But here's what I found is you could, have, you could say yes to all three of those. Yes, the Bible is true. Yes, the Bible is reliable. And yes, the Bible is practical. And you can still have the experience that 90-something percent of people in our churches have, and that is that the Bible remains the one aspect of their life with Jesus that is more of a should than a want. We want to come and hear good preaching. We want to worship together. We want to be in community. We want to have meals together. I'm in the South. I was totally expecting an amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, but then somebody brings up the Bible and we go, yeah, I should read that more. I should be more consistent. I should know that better after being around the church for 300 years. I probably should, right? The Bible remains a should for so many. And that was my journey until April 18th of 93. I can point to a day that things started to shift. And I want April 4th, right? I mean, November 4th of 2021, I want to be your April 18th if that's your struggle. I was invited to an event where a guy was... I was a youth pastor, a full-time youth pastor, and a friend of mine who was a youth pastor at another church had told me a couple days earlier, there's this guy coming to our church Sunday night who has memorized the entire gospel of Luke. And he gets up on stage with no sets, no props, no costumes, no other actors and actresses, and he quotes it. And while he quotes it, he kind of acts it out. Well, as you might imagine, the first thought that went through my head was, Dude, that's a lot. <laughs> right? The, the second thought, which I actually said out loud, was, are people really going to sit and listen to that for two hours? You know, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful or sacrilegious or anything, but my idea about what memorized, quoted scripture sounded like brought me back to my elementary school days growing up in central Kansas where once a year they would stand the second grade Sunday school class up in front of big church and one at a time really frightened eight-year-olds would go. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16. Right, and then the next kid. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his... Hi, Mom! Right? Anybody ever seen this happen? I got to tell you, there was this disconnect for me between memorized, quoted scripture and good drama. <laughs> I figured if anybody could make it somewhat interesting, it would be this guy. His name was Bruce Kuhn, and he had been in the Broadway cast of Les Mis, which <laughs> rumor has it is above average. <laughs> and so I went, no great spiritual motivation. I wanted to see if somebody could do it. I had never heard of anything like this. And what happened for me on April 18th of 93 is the living word of God went from being a phrase to a reality. And I find as I travel around the world, for most people, the living word of God is a phrase they desperately wish was a reality. I believe it's true. I believe they should read it. I believe they should apply it. But they don't love it. And that all started to change for me. I asked Bruce 
to go out to lunch the next day, picked him up at noon, dropped him back off at his hotel at 9 p.m. And he just started challenging me to soak in bigger chunks of scripture. And that summer of 93, I just said, okay, I'm just going to read Philippians. The next day I'm going to read Philippians. The next day I'm going to read Philippians. The next day I'm going to read Philippians. Got to the end of the summer and realized that I knew the whole thing. Right? How many movie lines can you quote right now that you never tried to memorize? You just watched the movie 150 times. Right? Don't get me started with The Princess Bride right now. <laughs> right? How many song lyrics? How many songs have come on the radio you haven't heard in 10 years and you're singing along by line two? Because right? you just heard it. You heard big, you heard the whole thing. Right? And you just soaked in it. And the word came alive. And the reason that I'm passionate about having the word come alive for people is for the first 25 years I was hanging out with Jesus, the word bored me. I believed it was true. I believed I should apply it. But when the word started to become a part of me, when I started realizing that the living word of God is a reality, not a phrase, I started not just being more generous with my money at a banquet. I started being more generous with my life. And that's what transforms communities. If every single person in here starts to like their Bible more, starts to read it relationally, not just informationally, to know Jesus more deeply, to be transformed by his Holy Spirit as we read his word to become more like him, this community doesn't stand a chance against the power of Jesus. Amen? And so while that has gone on to... I, it shocked me that while Bruce, make, that makes sense, he was a Broadway actor and acting was his deal, I had done youth group skits. <laughs> but March 3rd of 96, I stood up on a stage and presented the Gospel of John. And I've been traveling around the world now since then, telling stories for a living. It's a pretty cool gig. But since Margaret said that I had, you know, 30 minutes, not two hours, I'm going to not do John. Let's go back to Philippians. Right? <laughs> That's 15 minutes. So, But Philippians is actually perfect for a night like tonight because Philippians is a, is a letter all about the joy of partnership and ministry. And in fact, you see these themes woven out. The first one I want to point out right from the beginning, the theme of partnership is woven throughout this letter. In fact, after the little greeting at the top, right? Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ. After the little greeting, the first thing he does is thank them for their partnership in the gospel. And the rest of this letter just kind of unpacks this partnership. But that partnership word, that Greek word koinonia, that means partnership, has a couple nuances to it that we don't oftentimes think about that I think so perfectly describe the ministry of CareNet. One is that it is a partnership marked by joy. A koinonia partnership is a partnership that the people who participate in a koinonia partnership and the people who receive whatever is the output of that koinonia partnership all have an increase in joy. We see this spilled out all even throughout his letter as the word joy, joyful, rejoice appears more times per chapter in Philippians a letter written from prison more times per chapter in Philippians than any other book in all of Scripture. It's a, and so you hear, as Danny shares, as Margaret shares, as people talk about this ministry, just see them. I, I, as, as Margaret gave me a tour of the center this afternoon and we walked through, and that, that lady's got smiling and excitement down. She's super good at it. If you're struggling with smiling, talk to Margaret, right? She's got this joy as she talks about the center and talks about the people that she gets to serve, the people that she gets to work with. Man, there is a joy in that partnership. And do you think that the clients that get loved on there, that get counseled there, that are given hope there, that are lovingly guided toward life-giving, not life-taking decisions? Do you think that their lives aren't greater, filled with joy? A koinonia partnership is a partnership marked by joy. But the other element 
and the nuance of koinonia is that a koinonia partnership, whatever that partner, a koinonia partnership produces is what's considered a gift jointly given. The partnership exists to create something, and that something is given away. What a perfect description of CareNet. Because I don't know if you know this, but you know, if, if someone comes in and they want an ultrasound, do you know how much that costs? Nothing. Let's go with nothing. Super easy number to remember, right? You know, if they need some counseling, do you know how much their counseling costs? Once again, we're going to just go with zero. Right? Well, how about if they need parenting classes? Yeah, we're going to go with nothing again. Right? This, is a, this is a ministry that is just given away, given away, given away, given away, given away, day after day after day after day. That's the kind of partnership that we're talking about. And so let's hear this letter. I would actually really encourage you. I know that most preachers stand up and they say, now if you've got a Bible, please follow along. I would really, really encourage you not to follow along right now. A couple reasons. One, I might be using a different translation than you're using and comparing and contrasting translations is a good study thing, but right now I don't want you to get caught up in that. Second, and this is most important to me, I find that when people follow along, they get really caught up in whether I'm getting it right or not. You know, I'm about to quote a book of the Bible. Is everybody okay with me missing a verse or two? Okay. Two people. I was told Southerners are nice. But uh, okay, well, but here's the deal. When, when people follow along, the conversations I have with them afterwards are typically about me and what I've done. Wow, you went through the whole book and you only made three mistakes. Wow. And the bottom line is, if you leave this room and you're impressed or not impressed with me, we have 100% wasted our time. But if somehow the Word of God has come alive in you in a fresh new way that propels you to live more generous lives in this community, not a bad way to spend our Thursday evening. Amen? Father God, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. May all this be for your name's sake. Amen. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, Always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to think this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. God is my witness how deeply I miss all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Now, most of the brothers preach Christ. uh, (laughs) Excuse me. Some preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. What does it matter? The point is, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I will rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, because I know that through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything, but that now, 
as always, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. Yet I do not know which to choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the flesh. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and that I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation, and this is from God. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and fear that I now have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any consolation of lation of love, if any affection and mercy, and make my joy complete by being like minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit and humility. Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, Instead, he emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything... <clears throat> without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the universe by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrificial service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. For all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proven himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am very eager to send him to you so that when you see him again, you may be glad. And I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. 
and hold people like him in honor. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for the mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. <laughs> Regarding the law, a Pharisee. Regarding zeal, persecuting the church. Regarding the righteousness that is from the law, blameless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward toward what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to whatever truth we have attained. <laughs> Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my dearly loved and longed for, brothers and sisters, my joy and crown in this manner, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, true partner, help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and seen and heard from me. And the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that once again you renewed your care for me. Indeed, you have been concerned but didn't have the opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. 
I know how to make do with a little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and every situation, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Still, it was good of you to share in my troubles. And you Philippians know that in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matters of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my aid several times when I was in need. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send you their greetings. All the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen? Amen. Thank you. The living word of God is a reality, not a phrase, people. You see this partnership woven throughout, but, but here's another theme that pops up in there, and that is one of prayer pops up in so many of Paul's letters. And one thing that I love about the Apostle Paul is he doesn't just tell people he's praying for them. He actually tells them exactly what he's praying for them. We're really, really good at telling people we'll be praying for them. But am I the only one who has ever seen somebody on a Sunday morning, they tell you what's going on during the week, and you say, brother, I'll be praying for you. And then the next Sunday, You see them get out of their car, and as they're walking toward you, you pray, Dear Lord, I know that you are beyond time, and I know that you are going to help my (laughs) brother, Archibald. I know know that you were with him last Wednesday (laughs) when he had that interview. So, God of beyond time, thank you. (laughs) Hey, I've been praying for you, right? uh, Don't tell me I'm the only one who's ever prayed that God is beyond time prayer right? (laughs) But not Paul. Paul's like, I'm going to be praying for you, and here's exactly what I'm going to be praying for you. And this theme of prayer, when I speak at fundraising banquets for ministries, for care net centers, for for the other ministries, the, the idea of, hey, if you'd like to join our prayer team, almost always comes up. I actually want to hunker down on it for a second. Only about 45 minutes. Okay, just Totally kidding there. But here's the deal. There will be times when you'll know exactly what to pray. Some of you are on the prayer team. Some of you have gotten an email. Some of you will run into Margaret or one of her team in the store, and you can ask them how to pray. Be praying. But sometimes you're just going to drive by the center, and you don't know exactly what the need is at that time. You don't know what to pray. It is at those moments when I would like you to open up Philippians 1, and I would like you to pray... The Philippians 1 prayer that Paul writes, because the prayer that he prays for the Philippian church is the perfect model for how any of you at any point in time can pray over this ministry. He says in verse 9, I pray this, that your love will keep on growing. Pray that this center, that when people walk through the doors, when they answer the phone, when, they, when they're in a counseling session, when they're in a... Uh, uh, a room doing a, um, an ultrasound, when they're teaching a class, when they're with somebody in the boutique, that it would just be a place where people walk out of there and say, I don't know what it is. I, I didn't even need anything in the boutique, but I feel loved when I'm in that place, so I'm just coming back tomorrow. I need just a little love to ooze all over me, so I'm going to come to Karenat. The love would keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. Son, take those two. Knowledge, when you're talking about changes in, in the, 
the politics of this debate, as well as the, just the medical knowledge and counseling knowledge. There's got to be a continual growth in knowledge. And there has to be this growth in the area of discernment to be able to approve the things that are superior. I think the NIV says to approve the things that are the best because sometimes they don't know from the person that they're answering the phone that's on the other end of the phone, the person that walks through the door, sometimes what someone needs is a true like medical answer. Sometimes what they need is somebody to cry with them and just remind them that they're not alone. Discernment, like Holy Spirit level discernment, is something that this ministry needs. That they may be pure and blameless. Boy, wouldn't Satan just love to destroy with impurity the marriages, the relationships, the friendships on this staff, in this volunteer, on the board? Wouldn't Satan just love to just sow seeds of impurity and blame. Pray against that. Pray that they would be pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, that this ministry would bear fruit, which means more lives, and that it would all be done to the glory and praise of God. What would happen... If you combine the people that are in this room with the people that are online, we probably have somewhere 350-ish. If every single person took a day, what if you prayed November 4th and you prayed November 5th and you prayed November 6th and for an entire year they knew that every single day Philippians 1 was being prayed over this center? Because here's the deal. I believe that other than the local church, and the family, I can't think of a ministry that Satan would more like to destroy than CareNet. I believe God's primary tools for carrying out his kingdom work are the family and the local church. But if you're talking about a ministry whose primary purpose is life, and Satan's primary purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, I don't believe that prayer would just be a nice bonus for this ministry. I believe that if this ministry isn't coated, soaked, blanketed in prayer, it is a ministry that will fail because Satan is attacking too hard. So it's not just a good idea to be praying for this ministry. It's the most important. (laughs) So we see partnership and we see prayer. But then what else we see in Philippians? We see the Philippian church participating in Paul's ministry. Paul is miles away. Miles and miles and miles and miles and miles away. He's not actively doing ministry right now in the Philippian church. He's away. But they said this ministry has got to thrive. What Paul does, what he did here, what he's doing in other cities, this is a ministry that has to thrive. This is a ministry that we need to invest in. So they took up a collection. They said, who's going to take it? Some say that Epaphroditus, the guy that he said came and took him the the gift. Some say that Epaphroditus was an older, well-established businessman who could afford to leave for several months to do this job. And I'm pretty convinced he was like 22 and went (laughs) road trip, right? That but I don't know, I don't know, but here's what, we, here's what we do know about Epaphroditus is that while traveling, he got so sick, he almost died, and he bounced back from it. So if you're going to make an argument, I would actually argue for his youth over his age, but what we do know about him is he was just willing to do it. They, they raised his hand, and he was willing to jump in. That was how he could participate. But what we saw, what we see is we see a church that is participating so much that Paul becomes the first pastor pastor in the history of pastors ever to tell a congregation to stop giving. Right? Did you notice how many times in chapter 4 Paul's like, not that I'm looking for a gift. I am amply supplied. I have full payment and even more. I'm looking for what maybe a credit to your account. Not that I'm looking. Wouldn't it be amazing if so much came in that some of you who sign up as monthly donors got a letter from Margaret in like March 
and went, yeah, we're good. <laughs> Find another ministry to donate to. That'd be awesome because we're covered. We're amply supplied. We've received full payment. I mean, that's where. But here's why. It's because they saw this ministry that was so valuable, so important, so needed, that they said, it can't just itch, inch by. This is a ministry that has to thrive. And as I walk through the center today and listen to Margaret, stop me in every single room. This is where we do this. This is where we counsel. And this, oh, and this is where we teach our classes. And this is where we do ultrasounds. And, and this is my office that has Steelers stuff all over it. Right? <laughs> if, if any of you are sitting in this room and you want to know what a man cave looks like, go to Margaret's office because hers is better than yours. And... Uh, <laughs> and her team has more championships. And I can say that because I'm a Seahawks fan. Yeah, that, that one was awesome. And, uh, <laughs> and that, as I see this ministry, one thing that I think that we miss sometimes at these banquets is I think that sometimes we actually believe that this ministry is pro-life. It's not. It's pro-living. And pro-life is a piece of it. Getting the baby out of the belly isn't where this ministry stops. There is so much loving on wives, loving on husbands, loving on unwed parents who want to be better parents, loving on people who are scared out of their minds, telling them about Jesus, counseling them, people that have made a decision that is haunting them now, walking with them through the valley. There is so much living that happens. As a result of this ministry, about an hour and a half ago, Margaret and I sat back on that back row right there, and I asked her, what would happen if tomorrow we woke up and this ministry didn't exist? What, would, what impact would that have? And she said, I don't know that any of these scared clients of ours would have any place to go, and so they'd end up at Planned Parenthood where I'm guessing they're not going to be led to a life-giving decision and a joyful eternity with Jesus. This is a ministry that has to thrive. It's a ministry that loves people when they're scared, when they're alone, when they're hurting. And we can be a Philippians kind of partnership, a Philippians kind of participation. And I had... Margaret sent me, I said, so, so what is it that you need? And she said, well, for, for what we kind of need to get by, what, what we need with the budget item, like what we need to raise here is, is $87,000. But to thrive, <laughs> we need more than that. And so I'm rounding up. And I, I don't know about you, you know, I, I, so let's, let's, let's pretend, I like easy numbers with zeros on the end, so we're going to go with $120,000. So let's say $120,000, does, does $120,000 sound like a lot of money? So if there's somebody in here who doesn't, then they can just write one check and we can go home early. <laughs> Sometime I'm going to say that at a banquet and somebody's going to go, yeah, I can do that. But until then, okay, so $120,000 sounds like a lot of money. But you realize I'm actually not talking about $120,000 because between the people that are in this room right now and the people that are currently watching this online, if I divided that number into 120, do you realize the real number that we're talking about is 400 bucks? That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about $120,000. We're talking about 400 bucks. Does 400 bucks sound like less to have this ministry thrive in this community? make sure that they can do not just what they know they're called to, but whatever that God who does exceedingly abundantly more than all we can ask or imagine, when he shares the next vision to say, we can do that right now. We're talking $400. And if we break it even down like to a monthly thing, we're talking about $33 and 33, 33, 33. 33 bucks. I'm from Seattle. That's not even a coffee budget. <laughs> and I know that there are some people here who you look at 400 bucks 
And with the situation that you're in right now, 400 bucks would be irresponsible. You shouldn't give 400 bucks tonight. You should give 100 bucks or you should give 200 bucks, right? But I guarantee you there's somebody sitting in this room who 400 bucks would be borderline disobedient because you should do 4,000 or 40,000 because you're in a spot where you can. And you can pay for 10 people or 100 people who can't. I don't know what it is, but what I would love to see, I would love to see on the cards that are on your tables that have your name on it on a little envelope, I would love to see some of the $25 a month ones crossed out and write $33.33. I would like to see some of the spaces that say $250 crossed out and write $400. Bucks. That's what I'm giving tonight. Some of the ones that say $2,500, cross that out and write $4,000. That's what I'd like to see tonight. I, I would like to get a, a phone call from Margaret later this week that said, I can't tell you how many I'm, a, I'm really, really mad at you because there were whole things that were like $33.33 a month. You're just making me mad now, right? <laughs> All the math. But let's do that. Let's make sure that CareNet here in this community is a ministry that doesn't just survive until next year's banquet. But next year, when Margaret gets up on this stage, she shares with you how your partnership, your prayer, and your participation allowed God, positioned this ministry so they could respond to God's call in a way that this ministry in this community thrived. Amen? And so now, you've got those cards they're very self-explanatory. You've got a table host if you have any questions. And, uh, and, and, and ra you guys are in for a treat tonight because rather than just kind of having the sound guy turn on some check writing music, you've all been to those banquets before, you got something really, really good coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was so not planned and awesome. That was, yeah. But uh, we're gonna, you're, you're going to have a treat right now as Deandra comes up to sing and Cliff comes to play the piano and Nadia comes to share her dancing talent with us. Thank you. I guess I should say something. <laughs> Good evening. We're so grateful, especially to be sharing this song with you all. It's called Endless Alleluia. Miss Margaret specifically requested this song, and it's been on her heart for like a whole year now. And she directed me to this song, and it is, my heart has just, been enveloped with this song and I hope that yours will as well and it's a song of worship and it talks about your day waking up to God and falling asleep to God with God so I hope that you just embrace it in the to meet you in the morning when I lift my eyes you're the only one I want to cling to you're the first thought on my mind let our voices rise all creation cries sing
still the only one I want to cling to. You're the last thought on my mind. This is Nadia, Cliff, God bless y'all. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Keith. Um, thank you guys for coming, for staying with us tonight. Some of you are banquet hosts year after year. Some of you, this was your first chance to really learn about this ministry in your community. So I want to thank you for coming, for giving your time tonight, um, for opening up your checkbooks. Uh, you may take with you from the table the sticker that you have. You may also take with you the pin if you would like. Um, I'm a pin snob, and I love these. They're my favorite. They're not Cash Express pins. No offense if anybody's here from Cash Express. Um, but thank you so much. And I will return back to what I said at the very beginning. Don't let this be your only contact with CareNet this year. Find a way to plug in. Um, Keith talked about everybody taking a day of the year. I challenged you last year. I will challenge you again. Take that smartphone that you've got and all of its wonderful technology. I have an alarm set every Tuesday night at 9.30 to pray for CareNet. Why 9.30? My kids are usually in bed and quiet. I'm probably washing the dishes or folding laundry or something that doesn't require my full attention. And it's at that moment that I can stop and remember the ladies that are doing spiritual battle on a daily basis with love as a weapon. And so I encourage you to set up a reminder, whether it's 5 o'clock in the morning when you go run like Matt, or if it's 9.30 at night when, like me, you're washing the dishes. Um, so at this time, I will ask Matthew Hyatt. He is the pastor at Burns Church of Christ. Um, he is a fellow board member, and I will say also a friend, to close us out tonight in prayer. Thank you so much, and thank you for letting them know that I was the treasurer. So when I ask you, table host, to uh, bring me the money afterwards, that's not just a guy trying to run off with the stuff. Uh, if you'll bring the envelopes to me when you're finished. Thanks so much for being here. We appreciate you so much. What a special night. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we have heard and how we have been encouraged tonight. We thank you for the power of your word that lives within us. We thank you for the men and women who work and serve and sacrifice to share your mission and your love with those around us. And we thank you for another day of life and another day to live in your service. Please bless us as we go from here. Through Christ we pray. Amen.